hour. So uh, good morning, everyone, and uh, thank you for coming to this event today. Uh, my name is Carter Ward, and I serve as Executive Director of the Missouri School Boards Association. But I'm also representing the Coalition for Missouri's Future this morning. Uh, we have over 40 groups of uh, various uh, interests uh, joining together in that coalition, and all of us are committed to making sure that the governor's override or the governor's uh, veto of uh, House Bill 253 is sustained. So I want to thank you all for coming, and uh, I would first of all like to introduce uh, our president-elect of the Missouri School Boards Association, Mr. Doug Whitehead, who is uh, not only president-elect of MSBA, but he's also a sitting board member here in Jefferson City, Missouri. So Doug, welcome. Thank you. Okay. We should have more time to, to practice our, our comments since he's already introduced me. So good morning, everyone. Thanks morning. for being here. Again, my name is Doug Whitehead, and I serve on the Jefferson City Public Schools Board of Education, and I'm very proud to be president-elect of MSBA. Uh, over the last several years, I've had the opportunity to meet several school board members throughout our great state, work with them on the board, and um, I'm proud of that time proud of our mission, which our mission is to help school boards succeed. And in keeping with that mission, we seek continuous improvement in everything we do. Today, as is Carter, I'm representing, also representing the Coalition for Missouri's Future, a group of more than 40 organizations that have come together to oppose efforts to reduce state revenue available to fund our public schools and other critical state services. Later this week, members of the Missouri General Assembly may face a vote that will largely determine our state's commitment to nearly 900,000 public school students in our state for many years to come. I'm referring to the attempt to override the veto of House Bill 253. Should it take effect, this bill will devastate state services such as early childhood and K-12 education. When fully implemented, the bill will cost Missourians at least $800 million. The revenue reductions resulting from this legislation will adversely affect not just the quality of education we provide to our children, but also the quality of life we enjoy in this state. Again, in keeping with our mission, we don't believe House Bill 253 helps us. There are simply too many unknowns. We are not against reform, quite the contrary. We seek continuous improvement. However, Missouri schools are already feeling the squeeze from recent budget years. Public schools in the state are already underfunded by $600 million according to the legislature's own funding targets. Who is willing to guess what House Bill 253 may do. Should House Bill 253 force additional funding cuts, and we believe it will, there will be teacher layoffs, overcrowded classrooms, and longer bus rides to and from school. This bill has the potential to halt technology upgrades, eliminate many after-school activities such as sports programs, and limit the variety of classes available to Missouri students. If this bill becomes law, our children will face a competitive disadvantage as a result of the state's disinvestment in their education. House Bill 253 also threatens the investments we need to make in early childhood education. Popular programs that study after study have shown to be successful, like First Steps, parents as teachers could easily end up on the chopping block in the near future. The legislation will also likely shelve recent efforts to fund preschool for all children in Missouri. More than 108 school boards, which represents more than 750 elected school board members throughout our state, have passed resolutions opposing the override of House Bill 253. This speaks volumes about the concerns our locally elected school boards have about this harmful bill. They understand this bill represents a setback in our commitment to our students in their communities and throughout the state. The 
tax cuts contained in this bill are likely to have little, if any, impact on economic growth. We are already a low tax state. But the tax cuts and resulting revenue reduction are likely to have a significant and long-term, long-lasting impact on our state's ability to provide quality schools and ultimately the educated workforce we need for genuine economic prosperity. In the remaining hours before the possible vote to override the veto of this bill, we will continue to communicate and educate members of the General Assembly about the harm this bill will do to our state. We implore them to stand up for public education and vote no on the override attempt. Thank you. Thank you very much, Doug. Uh, now I'd like to introduce Mr. Nick Greggy, who is president of the Missouri Students Association at the University of Missouri Columbia. Who also wants to speak uh, in favor of sustaining the veto? Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Nick Drake. I'm the president of the student body at the University of Missouri. Um, and I'm here today to speak out against HB 253. Um, as many of you have heard, HB 253 would result in an estimated $800 million annual loss in revenue once fully phased in. Others have even estimated that it could be as high as $1.2 billion. Because this potential revenue reduction increases year to year, this bill only gets worse over time. Higher, higher education is one area that faces the deepest cuts and toughest budget times that we've seen time after time after time. With an $800 million state shortfall, higher education would be forced to make difficult decisions that include tuition increases, cutting staff and faculty, decreased wages, or even enrollment caps. Additionally, this bill reinstates a 4% state tail sales tax on college textbooks, which only increases the burden on people that are already struggling to pay for their tuition mm -hmm. and get the, get the supplies that, the, that are necessary to be successful in, in college. HB 253 represents a threat to Mizzou and its students. And I see education as an investment for Missouri's future. And, and what, what this bill does, it, it, it threatens the ability for our public schools to fulfill their role in providing a, a high quality higher education to our students at uh, in, in the great state of Missouri. Um, and I'm proud to stand with other education leaders in opposition to HB 253. So thank you so much for having me here. I appreciate it. Thank you, Nick. Our uh, third speaker this morning is uh, Dr. Reverend Dr. Uh, Cassandra Gould, uh, pastor of Queen Chapel AME Church right here in Jefferson City, Missouri. And uh, Dr. Street gave me with us this morning. Thank you. Good morning, and thank you for this opportunity. Not only do I represent um, one of the oldest churches in Jefferson City, we just celebrated 163 years uh, being um, African Methodist Episcopal. We are the oldest denomination in the United States to be started by people of color. Part of our mission is to serve the needy, and that includes the most vulnerable of our society. And as I look at House Bill 253, I see it as a really glossy piece of material that looks great on the surface. When we hear tax cut, we get excited about that. But underneath that is really too many strings attached, and those strings are designed to unravel the very fabric of the lives of the most vulnerable of our society that is the elderly and our children. We live in a state that, um, particularly in our larger cities on the east end and the west end being St. Louis and Kansas City, that many of our districts have lost accreditation. How dare we, how dare we spend more money on anything in this state other than education? And if we are deciding that we refuse to continue to give our children the quality of education that they deserve, that they need, then we're deciding that we really don't want our state to prosper at all. So I stand on behalf of Missouri Faith Voices and the constituency of those that are most vulnerable in our society saying we must <coughs> uphold Governor Nixon's veto to House Bill 253. Thank you. And uh, that really concludes the formal presentation part of the press conference this morning. So if you have any questions, we'd be glad to respond to those.
question for the school boards. So, 108 school boards have voted, passed the resolution in opposition to it. Right? That sounds like a high number until you realize there's about 523 or so school districts out there. So that means only one-fifth, roughly, of the school districts that come out in opposition to this. You put it that way, it sounds like most of them, you know, I don't know if they're in favor of it, but they're certainly not against it. Can you give us a little perspective on that? Did they all have a chance to vote on this and they all decided not to, or what? It's a great question. Uh, it's, a, it's a great question. The timing for school board uh, meetings, like in Jefferson City, uh, last month when this was all kicking up to, to start asking the school boards to uh, pass a resolution, uh, we didn't have it on our agenda. We don't have a meeting until next week. So the Jefferson City Board got together by phone and talked about uh, the resolution. We put a letter together and we sent it in to the coalition. Uh, many, they're, they're, I think it's a, it's a timing thing. I think there's many more uh, school boards that, that are against this and understand the ramifications. There's been countless meetings, webinars, uh, all over the state, and I think just a simple timing issue for school boards to get that in. Were there any that took an affirmative vote in support of it? Not that I know of, David, no. No? no. And I think also one of those 108 resolutions are the ones we know about. I think there are more out there that have not simply not submitted to to us. Uh, that so I don't know the exact number, but it's it's undoubtedly more than 108. But how much more I don't know. Thank you, David. Any other questions? Let me see. Are you guys, to what extent you guys prepared um, for in the new session? If there's a some revised attempt to come up with a similar bill. You guys prepared to keep your organization together? And uh, absolutely, <coughs> excuse me, absolutely. Uh, the Coalition for Missouri's Future is committed. We understand this is uh, probably the first round of uh, many uh, actions that will be uh, attempted here in the state of Missouri. So we are not only uh, prepared, but we are committed uh, to staying together as a coalition and uh, furthering the work that needs to be done in order to protect uh, so would you be opposed to any income tax cut or is there some sort of trigger language or school safeguard language that could be included in a bill that would cause you to be neutral or supportive? Well, what we are certainly in favor of is protecting and uh, Missourians and uh, in terms of the financial obligations that the state has in terms of what they have already committed to and, and funding for our citizens. So uh, consequently, we are we would be open, and I'm speaking now more simply for the Missouri School Boards Association uh, than the coalition. But I think in, in our various meetings we've had, I think we're all the same spirit. That education reform is not something that we are automatically opposed to, but we want to have responsible education, or excuse me, uh, uh, tax reform. Excuse me, uh, that we'd have uh, responsible tax reform that would uh, that would protect and support the obligations that uh, we have uh, made uh, to our citizens throughout the state. Yeah, what, what would responsible tax reform entail? Well, I'm not sure that I can really uh, articulate that at this particular point in time, but the overriding thing is that we're not going to uh, uh, put our state in a uh, downward trend of uh, financial support for those obligations that uh, we have committed uh, to Missourians uh, through previous legislatures or uh, through other policy protection. May I jump in on that? Sure. Absolutely. Mike, what was the, the year the funding formula was? 2005. 2005. So, you know, we would like to operate under a fully funded formula. And that's the, the law of the land and the statute, and that's what uh, we would like to see happen. Are we for continuous improvement, as I mentioned? Yes. Are we for responsible tax reform? Yes. We've taken stances on tax credit. Uh, reform in the past couple of years and, and what we would like to, to start with is funding the formula. And we've heard over the last couple of years that uh, education has gotten a little bit more here and a little bit more there, but the formula is still not funded. So like the Reverend said, you know, we can't put in jeopardy our kids, any kids. And uh, right now we're doing less with, le we're doing more with less than we've ever done before. Have you guys gotten any pressure from any lawmakers to uh come out and show support for the governor? Uh, 
I'm sorry, I didn't do that. Have you guys gotten any pressure from any lawmakers to show support for the governor? No, not that I'm aware of. So, no. I've received pressure from my constituents to protect <laughs> education. Yeah. Absolutely. I can hear the other side responding with, you know, the doom and gloom is based on a lot of assumptions that based on an assumption that Congress is going to do something and that if Congress does something that every taxpayer in the state of Missouri is then going to do something and that those assumptions are faulty. Have, have, you, have you built a case here around things that don't exist? Well, I think um, certainly uh, what we are facing in House Bill 253 stands alone really in terms of our perspective of that particular piece of proposed legislation. Uh, the fact that the federal government has this follow-up situation that compounds the problem is important to understand, important to know, but that's additional to the fundamental core problem that we have here, and that is the erosion of tax support dollars for essential services that the state needs to provide. So uh, it stands on its own in terms of what's within that particular bill and what it would do uh, to Missouri. So, uh, we're just focused on HB 253. The other big argument from the other side is that that, that $100 million trigger will prevent any harm that, that you guys are saying is there. What is your your take on that trigger? You don't think that's going to work? No, uh, we have real, uh, very little confidence. Uh, in fact, that trigger doesn't even apply to many of the provisions that are, already, that are in the bill uh, that are outside of that $100 million trigger. So, uh, we're going to we're going to proceed not just proceed we're going to realize a significant uh, uh, shortfall in revenue uh, to the state of Missouri if this bill is enacted uh, as it was written and consequently we are about sustaining the veto uh, that the governor has acted upon. I don't know if your groups do any. Uh polling of the lawmakers, so to speak. Where do you think you stand right now? How many, how many votes do you think you have against them? <laughs> oh, well, I, I'll tell you, I don't, I don't have a crystal ball, but I will say this. Uh, we feel that uh, the uh, momentum is certainly with, uh, with our side, and, and based upon all the news coverage of this particular issue and all the major papers and even some other papers uh, throughout the state and uh, news agencies. Uh, so we're feeling very good. Uh, and positive about uh, our ability to uh, to uh, sustain the governor's veto, uh, but at the same time, uh, we're not going to be presumptuous about this. We're going to continue to work hard. We're going to continue to reach out and reinforce with our legislators that we feel uh, share our perspective on this issue, and uh, hopefully uh, this week will be successful sustaining the veto. Listen, I think that looks like that's all the questions. So again, I want to thank each and every one of you for coming today. And on behalf of the Coalition 